Hey guys, you're watching the best practices show where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all over the world. And I have the hugest treat for you today. We have some of the most brilliant clinical minds on today. We've got the Kois and the Coachman team live for the first time in a treatment planning session. You do not want to miss this. So do me a favor, grab a pen and hit the share button. We'll see you in a few seconds. Hey guys, you're watching the Best Practices Show. Thank you so much for tuning in on this special day because this is a big one and I've got some of the greatest clinical minds talking about some of the coolest stuff in all of dentistry. Christian, you and I have had a chance to do quite a few of these and so I'm going to let you lead this and kind of introduce the why and who's behind it and what we're going to be doing today. So take it away, my friend. Okay, thank you so much. This is really, really, really very, very special for us, uh, me and Francis to be with, with John and Dean. Uh, as I always say, you know, we, we have a couple of mentors as we grow in our profession and John was always one of the main ones for, not for only for me, but for all my colleagues here in Brazil. So uh, uh, a few years ago when I actually started to actually be able to connect with John and, and develop things together and have the huge honor to do the DSD course over there that is actually happening in, in a couple of weeks, the next version of this course, it's really amazing and uh, even more amazing when we started to connect all his philosophies, his treatment planning uh, brain into our technology. So uh, when John mentioned to, to actually connect these two areas and do a first case uh, together, and that's what we're going to do in Seattle in, in two weeks, we're going to actually uh, plan, design, plan and perform clinically huge full mouth rehabilitation case. Um, I, I mentioned to John that we couldn't miss this opportunity since the, the communication was so rich uh, during the last few weeks, back and forth, you know, John and Dean giving their feedback and, and guiding us through the process of where they wanted to be with the treatment and how uh, me and Francis could utilize technology to express their thoughts and, and design all the guides, design the prosthesis. Uh, so uh, I immediately had uh, the idea of sharing this brainstorm session with everybody online. And that's what I, I want to do here. I want uh, uh, to bring the case back, you know, show where we started from the initial perspective, have John explain his ideas, and then Francis will uh, follow John's leads and try to guide us through the process of expressing uh, interdisciplinary plan from the 3D digital perspective. Uh, Christian, I just want to say uh, thank you for that introduction and I really appreciate the comments and and I just wanted to make sure everybody realizes Dean is also the surgeon in this case and uh, as you're correct, I'm doing the design. I feel like I'm in a unique uh, situation because after all these years, I've been practicing more than 40 years, uh, this kind of case that we're about to show uh, doesn't come around very often because it has so many aspects of so many other things that are very challenging. Uh, I also want to add, <clears throat> it's exciting being on the teaching side of this case, but when it comes to the DSD and the digital planning, I'm actually more on the student side uh, because I'm learning from from the DSD folks between Francis and Coachman, Christian Coachman, obviously, the Coachmans, uh, they are pushing us to levels that we've never been at before. And I am so excited to see how the planning phase, to see actually what was only in my mind before, to see it actually in real life. I'm so excited for the audience, uh, you can't imagine. Super cool, super cool. So my, my suggestion you. is, uh, Francis, you want to say something uh, just to introduce yourself? You know, I know you're a quiet guy, but... <laughs> No, with two guys like you and John, it's it's complicated to 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 say anything. But <laughs> no, uh, the planning center, the DSD planning center. Are you saying we talk too much? That's what you're saying that we talk too much. Well, you can understand <laughs> as you as you wish. No, I'm kidding. Uh, 
no, the plan, the DSD planning center, we are very, very excited to be part of this journey, you know, uh, with, well, with Christian, Christian is a part of this, but with John is uh, really, uh, with the COIS is really amazing to really go uh, through this case together because there's so much uh, to, to, to think and decide with the case and and has been a, a great experience, uh, John, to be discussing this case with you. Uh, the planning center here is everybody is very excited about this opportunity, and uh, I think it's going to be great. Uh, thank yeah. you for. That. I have to add one thing, Francis, that I think gets unnoticed. You know, you have a dental background that most people don't realize. Uh, because it gets uh, swallowed up by your amazing computer skills. I, I've never seen anyone uh, be able to use a system like this so thoroughly and so quickly and to work with somebody that also knows the dental side of it. This is a unique opportunity that I've never experienced before. It's really refreshing to work with someone like you. Thank you. And you get overshadowed by the other person in this <laughs> show but i i gotta tell you you're the power behind this and making this work and and i know christian knows that but it's yes. very obvious once you start to work in this system yes thank you john thank you very much for the words uh it's very appreciated to to hear this thank you so let's shall go we begin? <laughs> shall we shall we begin we're ready can i share my screen Yes, go ahead. So in, initially, John, you wanted to to share the what is what is the first image you wanted us to share, John? Uh, just the MIP position of the teeth, if you have that uh, image before mm -hmm. we get to the face. Yeah, you should guide me through the process, John. Whatever you want to see, just let me know and we open the file and we can <clears throat> navigate. So of course that, uh, you know, we, we, we try to let, try to make, bring this to reality, how this would work, not only for a special moment like this, working with, with, with the Koi's family, but so the dentist is sending us this information, pictures, SDLs, videos, CBCT, Everything is uploaded on the software and the magic word that I always mention is overlapping. So the 3D world happens when we overlap these images so we can digitalize the patient. So now the patient is in 3D. We have uh, the initial situation. We have the bite that the dentist wants us to work. This is overlapped to the face. We have the CBCT. And the first thing that we usually do is to uh, create a patiently driven smile design project to start with regardless where teeth and bone are right now we we generate a facially driven smile design project that is of course can be test drived in the face or uh, the dentist can ask for changes so it's like having the doctor over the shoulder uh, guiding a diagnostic wax up so let me weigh in a little bit about the patient. The patient is a 53-year-old female, and she's uh, past bulimic, <clears throat> or even to some degree, uh, some of it still occurs today. She's extremely phobic about dental appointments and has to be put to sleep for any treatment. It's pretty obvious you can see the ravages of the destruction of her teeth. And the reality is, is we're not going to be able to save any of the teeth. And so we've already made the decisions as far as the risk assessment in the periodontal aspects, the biomechanical aspects, the functional aspects, and the dentofacial aspects. And I think where many young dentists get into trouble, if you just looked at the teeth without seeing the teeth in her face, it would be very tempting to lengthen the upper teeth in her face which would be an aesthetic disaster. It would be moving the entire arch in the wrong direction. So, in order to plan this case properly, we had to use the existing incisal edge as the length of the upper arch. And then my task and challenge to Francis was to be able to look at the implant placement based on not lengthening the teeth incisally, doing all the lengthening cervically. In this way, we, we could reduce the gingival display, we could create normal looking teeth, 
Uh, but the vertical placement of the implants is going to be critical in order to develop that. The other thing I want to say about this case as people watch it, this is not to be done the way most cases are done where they flatten all of the alveolar crest. This is going to be done with pontic site development, so there'll be no pink in the final restorations. So I challenged Francis to come up with design elements that could allow us to do pontic site development on the anterior teeth and the implant site development as immediate implants and immediate load that Dean would place uh, when the surgery happens uh, a few weeks from now. John, I think the, the one thing that is very nice uh, on this case in terms of using digital to plan, if you go back to the initial model, Francis, you can see that... Uh, the ideal design is completely inside the ridge. So it's a very challenging case to design and plan without digital uh, because it's just impossible to develop a decent diagnostic wax up inside the model. So uh, I think it would have been impossible. Yeah. So if we, the impossible. Model, if we delete the model, and that's usually the first step, what we do is always pretend every patient is an edentulous patient. So digitally, it's very easy to just remove the model, create a facial analysis from the frontal perspective, from the cephalometric perspective, and create this ideal, uh, ideal denture. Uh, let's pretend, for example, that you are going to save all the teeth, for example. We, could, uh, we, we would start the same way, planning, for example, crown lengthening or ortho intrusion or endodontic treatment, whatever needed to go to to be performed we would start with the same ideal project and then uh, bring uh, uh, the actual position of the teeth to try to see what can be moved to make this ideal project happen of course that on on the moment that you told us that this is full extraction now and that we want to use her own ridge to avoid pink uh, the challenge is how to plan these ovate pontics in a way that we can condition <laughs> Uh, with the immediate loading prosthesis and hopefully create decent interproximal papillas as the tissue healed. Yes, you know, uh, as, as Francis advances this, uh, we have two things to discuss. One is the pontic site development and the second is the implant site development. Uh, if we're looking at the pontic site development, Francis, if you could go to a cross-section of a pontic in the ridge so that we can make sure the viewers see that analysis and also show the viewers how you were able to remove the teeth. Maybe if you go through it in the steps, how you're able to remove the teeth so we could actually develop the pontics and accomplish exactly what Christian was just talking about. Yeah, I can, I can also bring our chat discuss, discussion on, uh, on WhatsApp uh, that we, we had with the case. Uh, which is also very nice to understand how we communicate nowadays. We don't talk. This is something nice to be uh, telling the people nowadays. We, we, don't, we don't get on the phone and talk. We pretty much share images and we discuss, discuss about those images. There's so many details here. I think uh, 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 what we usually talk on the course is that treatment planning ideally is one challenge. Now, creating a communication protocol that allows you to treatment plan ideally every single day for every single case, it's another different challenge. And this is what uh, I think it's important to understand how to create a communication protocol that can happen super fast, that uh, a dentist on a busy day in between patients in few seconds and minutes can actually uh, ask for modifications back and forth. So it's a combination between the 3D software cloud dentistry and the WhatsApp group. It's what we call like a concierge service where these images can be shared and the dentist, uh, we can connect with as many dentists we need and start getting the feedback because as we know, we all have deadlines and things have to happen really fast. Yeah, I think now the audience is getting a sense of what I was talking about, how Francis was able to remove the teeth from the underlying bone architecture and now we can plan real pontic sites with real anatomy, not just trying to uh, understand the anatomy and presume it's correct. And so at this point, uh, Francis then used the concepts of pontic site development, and I've been doing it for 30 years, plus 30 years, but I've never seen it done quite like this, 
where we can actually see the osseous architecture and the soft tissue when we're building the plant. That's it right there. So you can start to see as the, as the dentist exactly what you're doing to take a lot of the stress away. What I'm so excited about here amazing. is when we're able to do it, I won't have the typical stress that was normally felt uh, when we would do a procedure so extensive as this would be. So you can see here, John, you can see in blue the bone, the remaining bone. You can see in green, if uh, Francis, if you keep the same uh, yeah, issue is, yeah. right in the middle of the central. Yeah, this is what you're doing. Let me, let me go this back. This is exactly there. what we, we did tooth by tooth. You can plan the remaining buckle plate of the bone. Uh, you can see in green the existing teeth that will be extracted, and then you can see in white the new uh, pontic or a button that will be developed. So, uh, you, John, you were able to tooth by tooth give us exactly the thickness, how much concavity you wanted to have inside uh, the alveolus, and how you want to leave the thickness for the bone to be protected and avoid, if possible, extra recession. Yeah, now we're able to take all the understanding of biology, which has taken over my lifetime, to now visualize the application of that biology in minutes. I've never, ever seen anything like this in my life, and I've been doing this for quite a long time, and to be able to see how we could place the pontics, keep away from the important structures, then use all our knowledge of wound healing, because when this case goes in, the teeth won't actually look the proper length until we get the, uh, the resorption of the facial plate. And so this is really exciting for us because I don't think this has ever been done before. Francis, leave it on the central. Leave it a little bit on the central. Sliced on the central, the vision. Yes, that's... That's, that's the idea, right there. Yeah. So measure from the pontic to the bone. Yeah, this is a, yeah, let me, if you guys want to really, I, mean, I can go to the software and, okay, so, because I was playing the video that we shared uh, on WhatsApp, and now I have the software. But, uh, yeah, the, the real challenge here was to really design the temp the way John was really, uh, uh, idealizing uh, and uh, with the information that we have uh, digital the dish all the digital information that we have so uh, really nice to see what we can really achieve with digital nowadays you know uh, put the slice right in the center of the central yep that's it. So we can measure the cervical of the pontic to the buccal side of the bone. Yes. And leave a space for all the proper wound healing and the changes in the ridge uh, resorption, following ridge resorption. And we're expecting a lot of migration of all the architecture. Yes. No, the bone, the bone, uh, Francis. So you have, uh, yeah, this is the tooth, and we yeah. want the bone, white to blue. Yeah, and the challenge here is really to 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 build a, uh, to be able to build a provisional that is passive. Uh, yes. Uh, that, yes. That will fit inside the ridge without uh, having to uh, remove any bone or, or either uh, be adjusting the provisional a lot to fit passively. So that's that's what we are doing, uh, really designing the provisional, taking into consideration the, the bone uh, uh, and the space that John's, John wants to, to leave between the pontic and the bone. So let me make sure I orient the listeners to why it's being done this way. It would be impossible for us to hide the interface under this patient's lip with the hyper lip mobility that she displayed. Bring her face. She would have to destroy the ridge to hide that interface. 
By doing this, we won't need to have an interface. We'll have a natural interface where the pontics will look like they're growing out of the bone. That's important. Now, the limitation for that. What's going to happen now is the cervical positions of the teeth will be dictated by the sockets, which would not be the typical case where you were having pink. You could move the teeth wherever you wanted them. We don't have that complete flexibility at this point. At the time of the immediate provisional, the cervical position of the teeth will be dictated again by the sockets uh, more than it would have if we were using the other protocol. Yeah. So, so Francis is now adapting the, the model to the, the face just to show uh, exactly what John was saying that really, you know, uh, typically we would do a white and pink implant prosthesis that uh, simplifies, of course, the whole process, but it's extremely aggressive. If you imagine, I don't know if you can bring the CBCT as well, Francis, to see where we would place the bone. If we would uh, have to reshape the bone above the lip line, you would have to cut, I don't know, like uh, 15 millimeters it's of bone. It's a lot, it's a lot. So this is the moment that probably when you saw this, yeah. John, you realized that we, you know, it, so biologically speaking, uh, for the benefit of the patient, we would uh, have to use our skills to develop a, uh, a bridge without pain. So what would have happened to most dentists if in order to hide the interface, they would have had to make a removable restoration to be able to build a flange that goes under the lip. A yes. removable restoration, even if it's on a milled bar, would be a disaster because we're not going to have a lot of room for all that hardware when this case is finished. And more importantly, since the facial aspect of this ridge is so prominent, trying to fit a flange outside the ridge would be another disaster because it would really disrupt the facial aesthetics. Yeah. Too much volume. Way so too right. prominent. Too prominent, yeah. So there's a lot of things that the dentist has to think about when we're looking at peri-implant aesthetics, moving from the single tooth relationship to the ridge relationship when it's on these bigger cases. And this case has all of those pieces uh, intertwined so that once we get through this, somebody would really understand all the parameters of, of the concerns that we have. Uh, the next one is gonna be the immediate implant site development and getting the implants deep enough regarding the remaining structures. And as we go to that, uh, we can look at that because I think it will dictate changes in implant length and slight changes in implant position to get around some of the limitations of the architecture. So here we see the ideal smile design, facially driven smile design with the new ideal cervical margins with subgingival concavities with the obeyed pontics and of course uh, retroactively planning the implants to towards these pontics. Uh, we can see the distances that you guys went through placing the head of the implant, uh, of course trying to av avoid the sinus, you can see trying to simplify the process, understanding if you know sinus lip is an option yes or no, what length of implant you want to use to simplify the procedure. Uh, and of course, uh, Dean and Francis, they have a lot of experience here on the surgical side, picking the right strategy. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, uh, I deferred this to Dean to make some of the decisions on the implant length. And Dean, could you weigh in a few minutes uh, about what your decisions were about shortening the implants uh, regarding concerns of the sinus? I think one of the things that was unique about the case is since we're moving all the architecture so far uh, apically that these implants are actually, for the most part, all in virgin bone. They're apical almost to a lot of the extraction sockets. So we didn't need to. And also where the pontics need to reside, the implants would be in the way. So we went with shorter implants also for surgical safety, but also knowing we're going to get really good primary stability because of we're being in virgin bone. And um, it was a really neat case. These implants, when you look at the plan without the extractions are quite a bit deeper than you're used to placing, but with the entire plan and where we need to move the facial aesthetics, 
uh, it all comes together really nicely. It's amazing what uh, Francis has done. I I'm convinced that without this type of surgical planning, the implants would have never been placed deep enough and this patient would have suffering these problems for the rest of her life because aesthetically it would turn out to be a disaster. The other thing with the surgical facilitation is how deep the implants are and when you go with longer implants we were worried about we were actually maxing out drill lengths and our ability to reach the final depth so it was really a convenience too to move to the shorter lengths um, with the drills which Friends. can be a concern in the back. Francis, you're moving too fast with too many things. You have to follow our our <laughs> our speech. You know, we are I talking. told you he was very fast. I told you he was very fast. You move the guide for a while and just click oh. on the on the less molar on the green implant. There's a nice image of the green implant and uh, yeah, on a side view, and then you can see uh, the relationship with the sinus, the green implant. If you click there, I want to see the green implant on the right side of the screen. Yes, I, I remember you guys struggling through the process of fitting an implant there, analyzing the sinus and the cervical. You can see the molar is right there, so we don't have much room right. with the emergence profile. Yeah, we have to be deep enough to get the tooth length that we want and not too deep to minimize the concerns with the structures. Because aesthetically, John, the problem here is that uh, you can have if you don't, if we don't pay attention here, we can create on the final situation a nice anterior area and gummy smile on the back. Bring <laughs> the absolutely, down. absolutely, that's the challenge. Yeah. And of course, yeah. so it's one side aesthetics, the other side the sinus, and then you have a, a super short implant there saving us. Yeah, I, I think it's good to tell, of course, that probably uh, Dean and John will not load uh, this posterior area. We're gonna be uh, probably working off with the more anterior implants, right, John? So that's correct. Gonna We're not going to load the molar implants immediately. Uh, we'll just use pontic, a uh, cantilevered pontics mm -hmm. on the terminals of all of the provisionals. Yeah, yeah. So, and John, this uh, I would like to go through, uh, if you guys allow me, to, to the guides that uh, yeah. the system that we're going to be using. Uh, very, very yeah, uh, this is, uh, we just finished the guys today, John, so it's new for you and Dean also. Uh, what we're going to be doing is that we're going to be placing first uh, uh, a guy that goes over the teeth uh, uh, of the patient, okay? It's a double guide, we call the clip guide. Uh, it's like a, a, in two pieces, they go together over the teeth and you drill the pins. Sorry. You drill the pins, okay? Uh, then the guide, the blue one, stays on in the mouth. You don't you don't take this guide anymore. The the idea is really to avoid having to switch the guides all the time. So this guide is there. Uh, okay. You you remove the teeth. Yeah? If of course, if you need to take out the guide for some reason, you can then you can replace it again and just uh, put the pins back. But the idea is to be able to remove the teeth without having to remove the, the space guide. Okay, so after that, let me... Then we go with the implant guide. Okay, just fitting over the... Another, friends, another situation, I, I'm not a, the surgeon here, but I'm just brainstorming here. What you can do is uh, extract mo most of the teeth without the guide and then leave three teeth fit the guide, yeah. put the pins, and extract yeah. the last three teeth. Yeah, I wouldn't say three, but maybe four and five, uh, just to really have uh, uh, very good Stabil step, uh, st stabilization of the guide. So uh, after removing the teeth, then replace the, the implant guide, put the implants, okay? And then after putting the implants, Remove this part and come with the provisional. The provisional will have some uh, uh, extensions. This is, uh, this is so cool. Uh, it's very cool. Have some extensions that fits on the guide also, and the holes uh, to be for the implants to be captured on the a specific and uh, very precise position that we've planned. 
So the so same expansion, the same occlusion, the same aesthetics, yeah. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, okay, so I, I would make sure that the, the viewers are realizing how important the planning is. Don't depend on, on just the software to do all the work for you. It's yeah. all in the planning. And that's okay. what this is allowing us to do. Yeah. No, the software, it's here just to help us, you know, just to make it very clear, everything that yeah, we can absolutely. do. Okay, so after capturing the provisional, you just go with a, with a burr and take out those extensions, uh, reline the, the provisional outside the mouth, uh, do whatever you want, make, uh, finish the provisional, whatever you need to do. But this is, it's meant to be very simple, to be able to do it chair side, you know? Uh, and then after relining, whatever, then you just go and screw the provisionals in place and, and adjust whatever and you break. need to adjust. Then you start praying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We know that for cases like this, you always have to pray, right, John? <laughs> <laughs> we have science. I, I hope it's science. <laughs> a little bit of brain, a lot of science. <laughs> a little, a little bit. <laughs> you always need a little extra help. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's the idea. We're going to be uh, bringing with us John uh, Guillermo uh, uh, Manzano, who works with me. He's the manager of the planning center. Uh, he's going to be with you guys there with all yes. the devices. And uh, he's also a surgeon. He's also a surgeon, and I uh, think it's going to be very cool. That's do you we're really quickly, excited. Do you want to quickly show the lower going into the upper, Francis? Let me the see. Because uh, ju just to emphasize, we got. Of course, we always uh, we always yeah. use the, the the idea that we learned from Kois, you know, and and you, John, you use the same philosophy here. You know, deep programming the byte, registering and scanning this new byte. So uh, from the, the CBCT brought us to the upper, uh, and then we brought your byte, and then with the new vertical dimension, with the hopefully a deprogrammed CR position, uh, and that's how we wax the lowers against the uppers. Yes. Before uh, before even planning the implant, so the sequence is always the same. We have the face. We delete everything that is in the mouth. We do the smile frame guided by the face. We wax the uppers, and then we compare the uppers with the bone. We plan the uppers, implants, etc. Then we take the upper project, bring the new bite, wax the lowers against the uppers, and then now we have the ideal lower with new vertical dimension with the existing two position of the lowers, and now we can plan if we're going to do ortho, crown lengthening, uh, extractions, you know, grafting, etc. And in this case, as you explained, it's full extraction. So we can bring this ideal pontic development towards the ridge on the lowers, plan the implants the exactly same way, measuring the distance between the head of the implant and uh, the cervical of the teeth, following all the principles that we learned. Um, we had a little bit more space on the lower, so it was a little bit easier to plan the transition and the emergence profile. So for the, um, again, to just make sure it's clear, uh, the bite was deprogrammed to get a passive centric relation registration, but more importantly, it wasn't just programmed, it was dialed into the vertical that we plan on building this new, the new occlusal vertical dimension. So what, everyone is seeing is the new occlusal vertical dimension that was generated off the deprogrammer so we could minimize any arc of closure discrepancies on the computer when we have a virtual bite. And it, it was very interesting to see exactly what Francis is showing now and this is very important something another thing that I learned from from you John as well you know as a technician if you get a inter maximum intercuspation bite and you open this on the articulator uh, you can get a nice space, but it's completely different than deprogramming in the mouth and bringing this new scan to the digital articulator. So we actually did both ways, and we can see the difference between just opening virtually with uh, artificial range and actually opening the bite uh, in the mouth with an organic 
uh, movement, you know? Yes, it's different. it's different. And you can see beautifully on the software the difference if you, if you, move, if you show the both lowers, Francis, the discrepancy, how not only the opening is different, but the midline shifts a little bit as you bring uh, the difference between. Yes. The so uh, it's, it's really very nice to analyze the byte and function in 3D on the computer. It simplifies the process. Uh, we can understand exactly the amount of space. We can come back to the mouth and uh, adjust the vertical dimension of the deprogrammer and rescan the byte, not only in CR, but on the adu adequate restorative space. Exactly, that's how it was done. Because it's hard for the dentist to guess on the deprogrammer the exact space to allow space on the back, on the front, before the upper wax up is done. That's always the challenge. There's a bit of experience that comes through that, yes. but yes. a lot of it is appreciating the facial direction that this will move toward. And, and so everybody realizes in the upper, in this, the way you see it right now, the upper teeth were not made any longer visually, only cervically. So incisally, the position is the same. The lower arch was extended incisally. So we could try to take advantage of slightly opening the vertical at the expense of the lower teeth, not the upper teeth. So the upper teeth could not be used to open the occlusal vertical dimension. And yep. we needed to do that in order to get the teeth to have the proper uh, ant anterior tooth relationship. Otherwise, she was a little too edge to edge. Now, Francis, if you go back to the blue model, the blue model is what we expect, we hope, to get after healing. So we were able to, to kind of predict uh, with the bone that is remaining there, how we believe after the healing, how much shrinkage on the gum we will get because yes. of the shape of the teeth, you're going to move from the upper red model to the upper blue model. Correct. And then if you slice, Francis, the uh, anteriors, we can measure overbite, overjet as well. Without uh, the models, maybe better. There we go. So we can probably measure. So we can be right at the center, center of the central. So approximately three and a half. And three, I think it's not bad. No, it's going to be great. The we see nice inclination of the palatal side of the uppers, probably protecting well the, the protrusive movement. It's not too steep. So it's looking good. Yeah, I'm very happy with the way this is turning out. Now, of course, John, I know that you, you've been doing amazing dentistry for 20, 30, 40 years, you know, without all this, you know, we dentists all over the world have been doing great dentistry without technology at all. Uh, but for me, as I look at this, I really have to appreciate the experience and the skills of people doing great dentistry without this technology. How, e how much easier it is to make more people to deliver better dentistry, allowing them to visualize things like this and then helping people to make better decisions. Yeah, I think that's so exciting to be able to realize that that's, a, that's accomplishable with, with all this technology. Before, the, the skill level at the chair was enormously different than it is today. Of course, as we always say, technology doesn't do magic. There's no miracles. Uh, knowledge, science, biology, function, everything is still exactly the same. The human body didn't change. Uh, the computers are just evolving to help us see things better. But we're going to see a lot of skills from, from Dean and, 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 you, and you, John. Clinically speaking, the skills are still demanding and, and we need to be prepared. But uh, for me, it's beautiful to brainstorm with these images. I, I just think we are uh, making 
better decisions, uh, visual, visualizing better the outcomes, uh, risk assessment becomes more clear, decision-making process, it's a little bit improved, I believe. Yeah, and basically, so we don't confuse the audience, the, the picture with the leaf gauge on the bottom right, that was only to compare to the deprogramming phase. That was an early bite record to get started. Then the patient was deprogrammed. I think it's like, uh, Chris, uh, just, I just want this. It's nice to, to, to tell that even a patient that is, uh, uh, the ideal design is completely subtractive. We were able to really design a motivational uh, uh, design and provide a mock-up to John so he could really go through the, the experience of having the patient understanding how she could uh, possibly look like after the treatment. Yeah. I think that's very important because these complex cases, it's not easy to, to many times engage the patient, you know, motivate the patient. Of course, we are talking about a lecture case, but in real life, in real life, we uh, we need to actually make the patients convince the patients that that's the way they need to go. It's not a simple procedure. It's not a it's not a uh, an expensive treatment. It's an expensive, demanding commitment, and uh, that's why we always emphasize the emotional link between doctor and patient presenting the the treatment in a different way to get this engagement. So we always emphasize the 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 fact that digitally we can modify the project to generate what we call a motivational project, printed project, and try this in the patient's mouth. Yeah, and I think what's uh, also really interesting is the mock-up that you see here on the right side of the screen is all done on the outside of the ridge uh, yeah. because we didn't do anything yet. And so the teeth look a little bit big when the final result will be all on the inside of the ridge. So it's very exciting to be able to compare to where we'll be in just a few more weeks. Yeah, the motivational markup is it's not the ideal project. It's an adapted project to overlap whatever is in the mouth. Exactly. But it gives us, from a social distance, it gives, us, uh, it gives to the patient a nice perception of what can happen if they invest in this project. She was in tears. Uh, when she saw that, because I have historical photos for her. Uh, she's never really looked like that in her entire life. You can see in her eyes. Yeah. Visualize this yeah, type of result down. without this technology. It's such a transformation. We can see her expressions on her eyes. Yeah, yeah it's it was really big. Beautiful. That's amazing. Francis, amazing job. I was just uh, more an expectator giving my opinions once in a while on the WhatsApp group, on the concierge service, learning from the process. A uh, huge learning experience for me, John, to be interacting with you and, and listening to you and, and uh, reading your messages and how you were guiding the whole team. I wish we could plan every single case, all the 500, 600 cases we do per month in the planning center. I wish you could be there with us planning all of them. <laughs> it's amazing to see what, what's in your brain to come out in reality on a screen. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. We, we actually need more people for, on the team, John. If you want to join us, um, we are more than... <laughs> We're going to be happy to have you here. If you're looking for a new job, John, we, we have a spot for you in Madrid. <laughs> we'll have to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but at least at least a visit, John. I hope you can uh, sure. come soon to, to visit us and you and Dean, and we can show you around a little bit. That would be great. Great. Super cool. My, my, my course participants are coming back to the room here. They were watching from the coffee break uh, the, the whole session. Uh, we already have one point, uh, uh, 1,400 spectators online, at least on, our, on the DSD side. Uh, so thousands of people. Uh, I really want to thank everybody that was watching. Uh, I, of course, want to thank my dear brother for, for, for doing this amazing work, not only on this case, but every single day, really providing people with this kind of, of technology and, and really transforming my dreams into reality. Um, uh, I want to thank you guys, uh, John and Dean, again, uh, for, your, for, for, your, for, for the partnership. You know? Allowing us to work with you guys is such an honor. And I hope we, this is just the beginning.
I really hope this is yeah. just the best. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. And, and Christian, one thing, uh, do you want to mention you guys are doing a course together here in December? Can you mention just a little bit about that? We're going to post a link to that. So, yes, we ha we have a course uh, and the honor of bringing the DSD course to the Koi Center. And this is going to happen December. I don't know if it's almost it's almost sold out. That's what I heard. Yes. But I there's still a few spots. It's December 12 to 15. Uh, at the Koi Center in Seattle, the full DSD program, the four days. Uh, and as I heard, we're going to have a surprise for everybody, a special party in one of the evenings. <laughs> yes, we will. Right. Yes, we will. Good. So Good. if you guys don't have any extra comment, I want to thank Kirk again for the technology of transmitting this, you know, and Ben, the, uh, our super IT expert on live Facebook transmission. Uh, I know we're going to do many more of these uh, in the near future. Absolutely. Thank you, gentlemen, for uh, lending us your time and expertise today. Uh, for those of you that are watching, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed today, do us one huge favor and just hit the share button. Share this with your friends uh, because this is just incredible and this is only the beginning of amazing things on the horizon. So thank you all for watching. Until we and see you next time. It was a lot of fun also. <laughs> yes. Very much fun. So there's no fun, stuff. there's no sense. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time on the Best Practice Show. Bye you guys all. have a great rest of your day. Bye all.